So in the last video, we talked about two different types of reliability. We talked about test retest reliability and the closely related uh, parallel forms or equivalent forms reliability. Uh, there's two more uh, major types of reliability that are, that are very different that I want to talk about here. The first one is, is called inter-rater reliability. Or sometimes you'll also heard, uh, see this called inter-observer reliability. And the reason it's called uh, inter-observer or inter-rater -re reliability is because it has to do with when we are having people, having judges or professionals, clinicians, uh, whoever they are, we're having some, uh, some people take uh, measurements for us. Uh, usually they're rating or observing some kind of behavior. So uh, we might, for example, uh, like we talked about earlier, uh, an example from the book, we might have people uh, rating or judging how aggressive children are from the behavior that they can observe as the children are, are playing on a playground. Uh, so we have some people, usually more than one person. You know, we don't, uh, we don't usually want to just have one uh, individual uh, take these measurements. If we have one person take the measurements, maybe that person is making some kind of mistake or error uh, that we're not aware of. If we have multiple people uh, all make the same assessment, uh, we can then be more confident that, uh, that the measurements are correct, especially if we can show that all of our raters, all of our observers or judges, are, are making the same general observations or ratings. So that is the idea behind inter-rater or inter-observer reliability, is we're showing that with multiple people rating the same behavior or observing the same behavior, they're all uh, coming to the same general conclusion. So we have some consistency... Now I think we're ready for the, the definition here. Uh, we have consistent, consistent results uh, from, uh, from different, uh, different raters or observers who are measuring, or at least they're supposed to be measuring, right, the same same thing. I say supposed to be because it's quite possible that we ask 10 different people to all rate uh, the level to which the children are being aggressive, and we might find that we get very different results. We might find that some people are rating aggression very low in most of the children. Other people are rating aggression very high, in which case when we calculate our inter-rater reliability, we're going to see uh, that it's very low consistency between or among the different, uh, the different observers. So this is actually something that's often done before a study is even started, that they get all of the people that are going to be doing the observations together and they sort of run them through some test cases to see if they're getting the uh, consistent results, if people are rating or, or scoring uh, behaviors in the same way. And if they're not, then they work on training those people, sort of calibrating uh, their judgments to, to be very similar. And they work on that until the inter-rater uh, reliability is very good, and then they might start the actual study to collect the, the real data with, in hand, some very good evidence that their measurement is reliable. So that's, uh, that's inter-rater reliability. Uh, the last major type of reliability I want to talk about is what is called uh, internal, and this is again quite different from the other forms we've talked about so far. This is called internal consistency. One of the things I like about the different types of reliability is that, uh, which is not always the case with scientific terminology, but with reliability, it's nice that uh, the terms are pretty descriptive. They're pretty informative in terms of what they actually are, are getting at. Uh, so internal consistency, it's internal because what we're talking about is we're talking about just taking one of our measures and seeing how, uh, how the different parts of the measure, how consistent they are. So, for example, this is usually done with, uh, well, it's going to be done with something where there's uh, multiple parts of a measurement that are all trying to measure the same general thing. So uh, we often do this with questionnaires, with different tests, 
we don't just use, if you think about this for a moment, you'll realize that we don't just use one question to try to measure a construct. So for example, with IQ, the IQ test is not, does not just consist of one question. If we give you the Beck depression inventory, we don't just ask you one question to try to see if you're depressed. There are occasionally times where it turns out a single question can actually be a useful measurement, uh, but most of the time, almost all of the time, I would say, uh, the questionnaires or other tests, the scales that we use, we, uh, we measure a construct using multiple questions. So internal consistency, what it is getting at is uh, looking at whether you are getting consistent results from the different parts of your measure. So let's go ahead and put that down. So internal consistency is where you get consistent results from different parts of a measure. And again, another way of thinking about this is that this is the degree to which different parts of, of a test or a questionnaire are measuring the same thing. Now, an, an interesting, and I, want, I don't want to confuse you by this, uh, so don't worry about this point too much, but an interesting uh, thing to think about is that if we have some, a test for a construct uh, that, you know, we talked earlier about how a construct is made up of, of different parts, like intelligence, for example, probably has many different aspects or characteristics to it. So it's a complicated construct. And if we want to measure the whole thing, we need to make sure that our test has different questions, different parts that are getting at those different elements of the construct. Uh, not all of those aspects of the construct are going to be perfectly related. Especially with something like intelligence, it may be very possible for someone to be intelligent in certain ways, uh, more intelligent in certain ways, and less intelligent in other ways. Uh, so we wouldn't necessarily expect all of the questions um, to give exactly the same results. In other words, with an intelligence test, if it were perfectly consistent, then the person would do equally well on every single question in the test. And that's not necessarily expected. But we do expect a, a certain degree of consistency since these uh, all of the different parts of the test are supposed to be measuring the same construct. There should be at least some level of consistency or relationship between uh, those different parts. Now, uh, I, there's different ways of measuring internal consistency. Uh, the book talks about something, uh, actually talks about uh, several different types. Uh, and, and with all of these, we could get into a lot of detail about them. We could get into how, to, how exactly to calculate them. Uh, but mostly, I just want you to have the concept so that if you see these things uh, in a paper that you're reading, you'll understand what they mean. So one possibility is we can, we can calculate what's called split, split half reliability. And this is where we're testing the internal consistency uh, by basically taking, uh, randomly choosing half of the questions on the test and comparing those to the other half. And specifically, we're going to get, let's see what the correlation is between them. So if somebody gets a, a, a certain score on one part of the test, we want to see if they also got the same score on the other. So in other words, if half of the if they if they uh, correctly answered half of the questions on the test, uh, we want to see if they also correctly answered the other half. You know, um, there should be some consistency between the two halves of the test. If we see that there's very low consistency between the two halves of the test, that implies that some of the questions in in the one half are getting at something very different from the questions in the other, ta uh, other half of the test. Now that's a very simple way of doing it, and it, it, uh, it's just dividing the test in half. You might miss certain specific questions uh, that are not really measuring the same thing as everything else on the test. Uh, maybe some question you put on your test is really not getting at the construct that, you, uh, that you're measuring, in which case that will tend to give very different results from all the other questions on that test. Uh, in that case, 
uh, we may not d detect that with split half reliability because the effects of that one question may sort of get drowned out by all the other questions that it's getting uh, pooled together with. So there are other methods that are more sophisticated. Uh, probably the most common one, most widely used one, is what's called Kronbach's, Kronbach's, this is B, Kronbach's Alpha. And you'll see it uh, abbreviated in uh, the literature with the Greek symbol for alpha, which looks like that. And uh, again, I don't, I'm not going to get into uh, the details of exactly uh, what these things are, but I just want you to understand that if you see Kronbach's alpha, that is a measure of the internal consistency. It is basically saying to what extent are the different questions on, on a test uh, measuring the same thing or giving consistent results. Uh, with with m all of these things, you will generally see it reported as a correlation uh, that ranges from zero to one. So, for example, uh, Kronbach's alpha, you might see some, you might see them talk about. We checked the in a paper. They might say something like, "We we tested the internal consistency using Kronbach's alpha, and the alpha was equal to Kronbach's alpha was equal to zero point eight six. So uh, with split half reliability or with Kronbach's alpha, you're going to see that these vary from zero to one. Uh, just like just like any correlation, they they measure they vary from zero to one, uh, and uh, like a correlation, uh, zero indicates that there's no relationship, right? Or we might say in this case, there's no consistency, and one would indicate perfect consistency, and you don't expect or even want perfect consistency in most cases uh, because, again, different uh, parts of the test may be getting to some extent at different elements of the construct. Uh, there's also an influence of noise or error in your test. So you, you would never really, in, in any case, expect to get uh, a Kronbach's alpha or a split half reliability uh, correlation of one. Uh, but something like 0.86 would be uh, very good. That would be a very high level of consistency. It's approaching one, uh, but it's also saying that um, it's you know the, the different parts of your test may be measuring different aspects of the same construct. So that's perfectly reasonable. And you'll often see uh, internal consistency that's substantially lower than that, and it's still considered good enough. Uh, it, it, it's not like there's a single number for these things that is correct for all cases. A lot of the time it depends on things like how broad um, uh, of a construct or how uh, what kind of variation do you expect in the different questions uh, on the test. If you're measuring a construct uh, that is, has a ver is very narrow and has a very small number of different characteristics or aspects to that construct, then you might expect that the, uh, that the different questions on your test have a higher degree of consistency. Whereas if you're looking at something very broad with a lot of different characteristics, for example, something like IQ, then you would, or, or intelligence, I should say, since we're talking about the underlying construct, uh, then you would expect maybe a little bit less consistency. Um, so you have to consider the context. Uh, but that is the idea of internal consistency.